Welcome to Backstage with Richard Ridge, where I sit with some of the theater's best and brightest, just chatting it up. This time it's two of Broadway's newest stars, and not only are they two of the most talented, they are two of the nicest. Please welcome Cinderella and her prince from Rodgers and Hammerstein's Cinderella, Laura Osnes and Santino Fontana. Big splashy opening. The show is up and running. What are you enjoying the most now? Oh gosh, uh, to me it's just it's kind of a relief to just be running the show now and not having rehearsals every day and new page like chunks of new pages and paragraphs and lines being added in. Um, that's yeah, it's just fun to have that part past us and now we can really kind of find the group. And the cast, we all get along so well. I think it's fun just to come to work and it's a great family. It's a really fun absolutely group and we all like each other, which is. I mean, generally everybody likes each other anyway, but this, this is special. Yeah, we, we have really, a lot of fun. Yeah, we have a lot of fun. I can see that, it's just yeah. watching you two sitting here. Um, you were the perfect Cinderella. I'm sure every little girl's dream. What is it like playing the most famous princess of all time? Oh my gosh, it's so cool. It's, it, we're not doing the Disney version, we're doing the Rodgers and Hammerstein version, and it's a completely new retelling of that story. So it feels like, in a way, I'm getting to kind of create this role for the first time. It is the first time this musical has been done on Broadway. Um, so it's been really exciting getting to be part of that process, but at the same time playing this iconic princess that everybody knows and loves so much. And Santino, for you, working on this. I'm also the perfect Cinderella. You are. <laughs> You'll have Matt to see Mays. that later. <laughs> in the next we revival. Him, anyway, uh, no, I have a blast. I think. Uh, I was talking about, you know, when someone said, when Robin Goodman came to me and said, we want you to do this, and I thought she was insane, I had no interest, and then I read the script, and Doug's, Douglas Carter Bean's version of Rodgers and Hammerstein's version of the fairy tale right. is uh, great, and I laughed when I read it, and I got, I was like, oh, and I get to sing like, some of the best songs, mm -hmm. and uh, I was looking to sing and it was perfect, and I uh, was happy to work with all the people that they had cast, and so I was thrilled yeah. by it. Because what I love about this production is each character has been written with human flaws. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Absolutely. Which never has been in fairy tales. Like, you know, like we talked about the prince opening night, and you said, what is the perfect prince? He was this one-dimensional yeah. yeah. person you saw, but that's what I love about this. So did that yeah. attract both of you to this project? For me, definitely. Yeah, I mean, because I, like I, I, we were saying the other night that if someone were to say, and people always say, oh, so it's different, you know, this person's different than this, or this person's different than that, and I would say, well, what was the other prince? Yeah. What was his personality? What was his sense of humor? What was his problem? What was his joy? You don't know. You know nothing about him. So the fact that Doug decided to really try and humanize everybody, not just me, but the right. stepmother, you understand a lot more about her than you ever did before, or... Uh, the characters he created. The stepsisters are different. They have different personalities mm -hmm. and they have different desires and wants. That's all, I mean, that's what gets me excited as a theater goer and also as an artist. So uh, to see that someone gave him thought through his life and his journey and his past, then flesh I get to, yeah, flesh it out. To get to, to jump into that, that's a joy. 
you know, this is such a big, beautiful Broadway musical, a throwback to the old days because you have a huge orchestra, huge mm -hmm. company, gorgeous big sets and costumes. Was the rehearsal process complex with putting it all together? Uh, yeah, we, I mean, we started doing readings for this musical uh, a year ago, last January, and we did a big workshop over the summer and like two or th two more readings coming in the fall and then the workshop really helped us actually, and Mark, Mark Rokar, our director, and all of, of the designers, really kind of see how in the world this magical fairy tale was actually going to happen. You know, it says in the script, it's like, she spins around and is suddenly in a gold dress. And you're like, <laughs> great, okay. And now it's William Ivy Long's problem and challenge to make that actually happen. And um, he did, but they've been working on it for a year and a half, kind of, getting pictures and inspirations together and starting to make plans and designs of how it was all going to happen. Um, but getting to do the workshop over the summer, you know, they built, you know, kind of wooden structures of the set things for us so we could start figuring out how that was all going to move. And I remember in rehearsal, there were a lot of things that Mark was so smart about being like, oh, the fence has to be a foot more this way because then the throne can't come on. And he had it all in his brain yeah. how it was going to happen. And it was remarkable getting into the theater finally for Tech Week, and it went pretty smoothly despite being such a gigantic show technically. Yeah. He had thought it out remarkably well. Because, I mean, your first scene is you're fighting with this, you a know, giant knife or however big he is. Yeah, in armor. Yeah. In like a giant suit of armor right. that they built, that William, I mean, that they built based off of uh, actual armor in the museum, in the Met. They literally. It's, you know, it, and you wouldn't know the difference. If you took a, a black and white photo of my armor and you put it up to a black and white photo with those others, you wouldn't know. Uh, it's a hugely ambitious show, but and it is a testament to Mark Brokaw, who had it all in his head and then assembled the best people in the country mm -hmm. who do all of these jobs. Yeah. You will not find a better... William Ivy Long's costumes are incredible to begin with. Steal the show. <laughs> and then, on top of that, and they create the characters. I mean, yeah. that is so... It's moving to me as an actor because you realize someone has really done so much work for you. I show up and I am in those costumes. It does a lot of the work. Yeah. <laughs> he's the prince. And the reason he's the prince is because he's wearing the best clothes in the world. And William did that. But then to do the magic on top of that, he worked for Siegfried and Roy, so he has all this knowledge of magic and all that stuff. Good luck. Good yeah. luck finding someone else. Yeah, exactly. Because all the transformations happen around your character right. and you make it seem so effortless. <laughs> well, yeah. it, it kind of is. I mean, obviously, it took a little bit of work finessing, um, you know, those magical costume changes and getting to the point where now they're, they are so smooth. But it's, they're kind of foolproof. I mean, there's, there's no smoke and mirrors involved and it's not a blackout and there's no, you know, flash of light or a body double or anything. It's all just me and... I, I actually do all the work myself, which is exciting in a way, and it's also nice that I'm not having to rely on anybody, that I know exactly what's going on, but it's also scary because if something goes wrong, it's my fault. <laughs> yeah. The Rodgers and Hammerstein score lives so beautifully in both of your voices. Thanks. What is it like singing their music? It's great. It's, yeah, it's amazing. We have a 21-piece orchestra led by Andy Einhorn, and um, it's just lovely to get to bring all of these lush songs and this gorgeous score to life for the first time on Broadway. It's really great. I was doing a guest spot on a TV show with Patrick Wilson, and he heard that I was uh, I was having to decide between that and between Cinder doing Cinderella or doing something else. And he uh, played a doctor in the show, and I played like some sick person, which I normally do. <laughs> and he said, uh, "Oh, you got to you got to do Cinderella." And I was like, "Patrick Wilson, why? Wait, really? You think that's?" And he was like, "You have to do it." It's like, it's not, it's not an option, because do you know how many people in the world have got to sing those songs? Not many. He was like, if I was younger, I would want to do it. He was like, I, I would, I, and, and then I started thinking, he's right. Do I love you because you're beautiful? Ten minutes ago, I have two songs no one really knows. Loneliness of Evening is gorgeous. And they're written for the voice so well. Yeah. That's what's, again, a lot of the work is done for us. Yeah. I mean, we just kind of have to show up. And, uh, no, singing with a 21-piece orchestra every night on Broadway. And those orchestrations, Gorgeous. Danny True, yeah. who did the orchestrations of, like, Beauty and the Beast, the movie, those orchestrations and the Disney stuff, that's, 
That's static. really special. And what David Chase has done, which not everybody really understands, is epic. He took, he's basically stood in for Richard Rodgers. He came in with yes. that entire score, <laughs> underscored every scene, understood how to combine songs, how to put bridges where there weren't bridges, and then rewrote do it. Rewrote several lyrics. Rewrote lyrics way, yes. with the blessing of Rodgers and Hammerstein yeah. and went through various drafts of that, but also understood how to attach that all to character and to story. That's a huge feat. Yeah. And only like music nerds who are down in a basement somewhere are going to figure that out. Yeah. But we know it and we're thankful for it. So I want to go back to the beginning. When did you each realize you wanted to be in this business and that you had the talent to go there? My moment was that my parents say I got a Fisher Price tape recorder with the microphone on it when I was two years old for Christmas and I used to carry it around with me everywhere singing into it. So my parents saw that I liked to sing at a young age. I used to listen to like um, Secret Garden and Les Mis and act them out in my living room. I sang Castle on a Cloud in my kindergarten talent show. So I, I kind of for as long as I can remember have been singing and wanting to be on Broadway. Okay. You know, I was, my sister's very, I was thinking about this because my whole family came and visited. My sister's very shy, uh, very reserved. And I remembered when we used to go to like the community pool she, is, hold on, I'm going somewhere, Your Honor. Let me continue. And uh, she would give me money and say, I want this kind of candy and I want this kind of, like go to the thing and get the candy. So I would always kind of be forced to yeah. suddenly have a, a persona or a personality that could be public. And I was thinking about that, what, seeing her, and I was realizing that in conjunction with my grandfather is a huge influence on me. And as a kid, he babysat me a lot and he would take me to Blockbuster and rent a bunch of movies that he wanted to see and then just sit me in front of the TV and watch them. So I grew up watching Singing in the Rain and Bridge of a River Kwai and <laughs> uh, Twelve Angry Men, very mm. bizarre, eclectic uh, group of movies. And then he would just rewind them and play them again. So I would watch them over and over and over and over again, and it just uh, captivated me. And I think because he loved them so much, I started to love them so much, and then I wanted to start recreating that. I used to take a tape recorder of those That's Entertainment yeah. uh, shows, you know? It's really random, but I would know that. But the, and then I would listen to them over and over and over and over again. I would start writing it out. Like what I was, like I did a uh, Who's on First, that yeah. Ivan Costello said. I used to write it out in case they needed the script. I don't know. Like, <laughs> it made no sense. But, and I was always that... Um, I could always kind of snap into then wanting to turn that into a performance and wanting to communicate with other people. I feel like I had a bunch of friends who were here from high school the other day and they were at the theater and they were like, oh, it's so awesome, it's so cool. And I was like, I'm really just doing what I did in high school. Yeah. It's just bigger. But so Tommy, <laughs> Tommy Toon used to say thing. that. Tommy Toon said, summer stock was one thing, Broadway is the same exact thing, just bigger, more exactly. Yeah, that's exactly, exactly it. It's the same work, it's yeah. the same process. It's the same type of, you know, We get to be family. kids. I mean, it's yeah. really so much fun to get to, and everything I, everything we, we do is, that element of play yeah. is what everybody always ends up wanting. So you always end up finding your way back to that. There's a lot of, you know, strum and drum about like, oh, I've got to be this or I've got to be that. And then it always comes back to have fun and play. Yeah. Yeah. I want to talk about influences. I know a major influence for you early on is it Ken Washington from the Guthrie? Yeah, yeah. He's a mentor of yours, right? Yes, he is. And he's huge. Sort of, what did he tell you? He, I went to this, the National Foundation for the Advancement of the Arts, Young Arts Program, which is a scholarship uh, competition, which was a huge influence on me. And he was one of the judges. Anthony Rapp was one of the judges. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, Kimberly Scott, a great actress, was also one of the judges. And we had to do, I chose to sing a song and did a monologue. And my monologue, uh, everyone else was doing kind of contemporary monologues that sang. And I did a seagull monologue. And he came up to me after, he was like, you know, why'd you do that? Why did you do that monologue? And I was like, what do you mean? He was like, well, why did you choose to do a Chekhov monologue? You were 17 and you sang, I sang uh, Something's Coming from West Side Story. And uh, I said, well, I just really feel like Treplev, you know, <laughs> needed to be heard, you know, if his mom only would have listened to him, he wouldn't have killed himself in the last act. And he said, uh, at the time I was planning on going to a music school. Yeah. And uh, he said, you're an actor. He's like, I think you should go to acting school. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think you'd be making a mistake if you didn't. 
And at the time, I was really kind of mad. Like, who are you? You don't know me. And then over time, uh, I really grew to trust him in a huge way. And my entire, and then I went to school at the Guthrie where uh, I studied nothing but classical acting, really, and contemporary stuff, but no singing, no musical theater. And um, I really put my artistic future in his hands, and Joe Downing's hands, and Scott Freeman, who was one of the acting teachers, and Virginia Ness Ray, these amazing, and Marcella Lorca, amazing teachers who, and Tyne Turner, uh, who I owe a lot to because they really kind of took me under their wings, and, um, and I just kind of went with it. That's one of them. Laura, for you, early influences that set you on your path? I, I, everybody has such a different path on how they got here, and I, I mean, me being the one acting out musicals in my living room was the one listening to Linda Edder and Christian Knoll and Sutton Foster and Susan Egan, you know, having those voices kind of influenced me at a young age. I also had two really wonderful directors um, in Minnesota that yeah. I worked with. My high school theater director, Dennis Swanson, um, who cast me in my first show in third grade, and we ended up doing probably eight or ten shows together throughout my youth in Minnesota. And then um, Matthew Howe, who was working at the Children's Theater Company, who, um, who I, I did uh, The Wizard of Oz with him my senior year of high school, and then went back to uh, be an apprentice there for a year after I went to college, and he is one of the best directors I've ever worked with. He's so, and he's so good with kids and cultivating um, talent in young artists and confidence in them. Well, let's talk about you. You both have these wonderful careers because you both have worked on things you wanted to work on. I mean, you've done musicals and plays and comedies. You've done, you know, ingenues. You've done the dark roles like in Bonnie and Clyde, Tony nominated. Mm -hmm. Let's get into some of the roles. Yeah. It all began for you with Grease. Right. You're the one that we want from the <laughs> reality <laughs> show. I watched that every <laughs> single week. You did? You know I did. I told, I, we, were, we were all addicted to that. And I think I told you at the time when you got to New York, I said, you have auditioned for millions of people. You could audition now for anything in the world and they should just hand you something. <laughs> It, yeah, I mean, it was so crazy. I never thought I would be that reality show girl. And I'm I, I'm relieved I've kind of grown out of that stigma now. You know, a lot of people still kind of associate with me, associate me with that. And that's fine, that's yeah. great. It was an amazing springboard for me, and I'm grateful that I did it. I'm, I don't ever regret doing it, obviously. Um, but, yeah, I... I think because the prize of doing that competition was the lead in a Broadway show, yeah. and that was my wish, is that's that's why I went for it. And uh, I just had this kind of strange peace throughout the whole time I was on the show, that I was just supposed to be there, and whatever happened, happened, and if I, if I happened to win, great, dream come true, and if not, I would go back to Minneapolis and continue creating a name for myself there, and maybe end up in New York someday. So, um, yeah, but getting, yeah, getting to do Sandy was, was wonderful. And beating Kathleen Springer. Marshall, which led to other things. Yes, Kathleen was yeah. amazing um, t to have as my first Broadway director. She was, there's something so kind of motherly and warm about her, and that's exactly what I needed and what Max needed. You know, we were, we were brand new to Broadway, and she was perfect. Yeah, and Santino, for you, we first, I first fell in love with you in The Fantastics. Oh, I mean, yeah. The Boy, I mean, that was so wonderful. Yeah, it was my first job in New York. I just played Hamlet at the Guthrie. I was 23. 23. I was. And, uh, and again, I had come, I, I knew it was time for me to, to leave Minneapolis because, uh, yeah, it was, the end of a, it was the end of the old theater. The old theater was demolished right after that Hamlet. And then, uh, so I was like, I'm going to go to New York. And... Um, Mel Marvin, who was a great composer, did the music for Hamlet, and uh, he called Tom Jones, because he knew they were doing the Fantastics, and he said, I think, and he knew I sang, he said, I think you should see this kid, and he saw it was my first audition in the city, and I was super lucky, and, uh, and it was also the exact opposite kind of show than Hamlet, yeah. yeah. so I was like, I'll do it, let's that do it. That was your first audition in New York? Yeah. I got it. Well, don't let's snap. Let's, but it, it sounds like good that way. No, it's yeah. I know it's dark. It's also dorky, but yeah, Ooh, it's, it's great. Speaking. It's what we all thrive for. So yeah, I really came to the city for that. And Tom Jones is great, and I loved that yeah. experience. Yeah, Nellie Forbush, big shoes to step into. I mean, everybody oh in this town God. had fallen madly in love with Kelly O'Hara. Of course. But you were brilliant in this. You made her your <laughs> yeah. own. What was it like tackling her, the role of Nellie? Oh gosh, that it was definitely intimidating. But the best next step I could have ever, ever asked for coming out of Greece and the whole reality show experience. Um, 
I, it was such a, I thought it was such a long shot. I was like, why are they even having the audition? That's really nice of Bernie Telsey to like call me in for this. And I was shocked to get a call back. I went through a series of four auditions, a work session with Paolo Shaw, who was playing Emil, and with Bart Cher, and had to be approved by the Roger and Hammerstein estate. And, um, and then I got the call that I was <laughs> getting the offer, and I wept. And I was so excited, but I was like scared and just so honored and every emotion, every full gamut of emotions. Um, I got three weeks of rehearsal and I got to trail Kelly one day, yeah. who was always so gracious and kind. And I looked up to Kelly so much. I saw her in Light the Piazza a few years before and never would have dreamed in a zillion years that I would be replacing her in her next show at the same theater. Like, again, and then getting, getting to do that role was wonderful. Nellie is so complex and so multi-layered. And uh, I felt like that was my, I grew up <laughs> during that show and getting to, getting to do that role. Your Broadway debut, Sunday in the Park with George. Yes. Working with Sondheim, what was that like? Oh, it was cool. It was yeah. really cool. I mean, I had a small part. I was happy to do it. And uh, Sam Buntrock directed that, and he's, he's a great friend of mine now. And, and I've made so many great friends from that yeah. show. Mar Mary Beth Peel and Ann Nathan. And, I mean, I could go on and on. Yeah, Wasn't but, uh, intimidating at all, working with Sondheim? I, I mean... Uh, if I had a bigger part, it may have been. It wasn't really. It was great. I mean, my best memory, one of my memories of him in that was uh, I had the line, uh, I like the one in the light hat. Yeah. And however I said it, I don't even remember how I said it, but I remember hearing him laugh at the Sitzbro with the way that I said it. And he just, there was like a ha. <laughs> like he just, and I, I'll take that. I mean, your approval. Yeah, it was, well, or that he heard it in a new way or that there was something that he got. And James Lapine I had uh, done a reading with before, so yeah. I knew him, and he was always very nice to me. Um, I had a great time. And it actually it reminded me a lot of when I was at the Guthrie, because I, I played two different parts, three different parts. I had a wig, I had like tattoos as one character, nice. and a, an accent, and then the other character uh, got to do something completely different. So. And then you got to play Hope Harcourt once again with director Kathleen Marshall. Kathleen, indeed. Gorgeous role. I mean, dancing role, singing Finally. role, like, like Ginger Rogers. Yes. What was that like? It was lovely. Um, that show came at such a, a lovely and uh, just important time in my life, getting to do that happy, go lucky champagne of a musical and getting to work with Sutton Foster, getting to work with Joel Gray. Um, my roommate Jessica Stone and I yeah. became dear friends during that whole experience. I getting to work with Colin Donnell, who I had done a reading with. Love him. Um, a few years before, so it, it was a joy. It was a joy to come to work every day, and uh, it's such a goofy show, and I feel like our cast uh, was so perfect, and yes, Kathleen finally yeah. let me dance <laughs> on Broadway. And then you playing Tony, the older brother in oh, Billy right. Elliot. I was like, I wasn't in West Side Story. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you could do that too. <laughs> no, too old. Uh, oh, um, I don't think so. Yes, Billy Elliot, which was a huge, it was the first time I'd ever been in anything that big. It was huge. Uh, and I got to, I was playing the kind of dramatic heavy <laughs> of sorts. Um, and uh, yeah, it was like an epic mega musical, British mega musical. And I, I, um, and I was excited about that. I remember when I was auditioning for it uh, during Sunday in the Park, I would go up to Jenna Russell's uh, dressing room because she had spent time in the north country of England. And she was working on me with that dialect because that dialect is very tricky. But that's the kind of stuff I get excited by. So. It was a fun, and in the time, every other word was the F word. And you won the Drama Desk for playing Stanley <laughs> in, in Neil Beach. Simon's Brighton Beach Memoirs. I, I mean, did. that came out of the blue. I remember that night, you were there, you were in blue jeans, you weren't even going to come to the ceremony. <laughs> I've never seen someone, he dashed over the seats. We were so happy for you. I was so, I was so shocked. Yeah. I went with no one. I wasn't going to go. My, by yourself. My <laughs> agents said, you know, they were like, don't, you, they're like, you should go, you should go. It'll be good for you to go. And I'm glad I went. And of course, you were Tony nominated for Bonnie Parker, for Bonnie and Clyde. Different type of role, not the good girl this time. That's right. Yeah. What was it like? <laughs> it was a nice change for you, wasn't it? Oh, absolutely. And uh, it was another bittersweet thing because I feel like that show was my baby. I, I was with it for three years, creating it from nothing, from the very, very beginning. Did every reading, did every out of town, and uh, I feel like you know, Frank Wildhorn and Ivan Mitchell wrote the book, and John, uh, Jeff Calhoun, who directed it, we're all starting to really kind of formulate the show around what I brought to the role, which is just so, um, just fulfilling as, as an actor getting to create a brand new show like that. 
Um, but yeah, same thing. It's the business is what it, what it is, and everything cannot be a huge success. But at least we made it to Broadway, and we got to do it for two months. And I'm very, very grateful for the experience. And yes, to get the recognition yeah. five months after it had closed was, again, the shock of my life. was not expecting a thing. I was not watching the TV that morning. I got the call from my agent that was like, and I didn't answer it. I remember waking up in bed, and I'm like, why is Tim calling me so early? And then he texted me and he said, call me now, all in caps, like complete, like exclamation points. And then it kind of clicked that the Tony nominations were going off this morning. And I thought, is there some way where maybe this happened for me? And it did. And I, again, wept and, and <laughs> laughed and wept and cried. Boys who talk about farms and horses, they talk too much for me. I don't need to end up in a rocking chair. To live your life just once, if that's how it's gotta be. And I'd rather breathe in life than dusty air. Dying ain't so bad. Not if you both go together. Only when you're left alone does it get sad. But a short Los Angeles, you got to do the show with Dark Sands. Yes. And then in New York with Jeremy Jordan. Right, and they were both fantastic. I mean, both brought such different things to the role, and um, I'm thrilled and honored to have played opposite both of them. Yeah. And then Santino, absolutely brilliant in Roundabout Theater Company's oh, Sons uh, of the Prophet, oh, playing yeah. Joseph. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. That was the, the most recent. Yeah. That was probably one of the most perfect things for you when it's the perfect role. <laughs> yeah. You know, when artist meets material. I mean, you've all had those kind of yeah. things. But was that like it? Was that like it for you? For yeah. The show? It was very special. Uh, I had done, I think it was, had I done Ernest? No, I hadn't done Ernest yet. So I hadn't gone back to the roundabout yet. But I had, I had been injured and was dealing with all of that crap. And Stephen, I had got a call saying they want you to do this reading. And I was actually having a hard time being able to read at the time and uh, had a friend read the script for me. And she said, you should do this, it'll be good. And she kind of told me what happens in mm -hmm. the scenes. But I didn't really know, and then we got to the, the reading and uh, read it and I, you know, there was the line, the last, one of my last lines was, it's, I've had a bad year. <laughs> and that was the understatement of the century for me. So I, uh, of course, ran up to the writer and the director and I was like, what do you, how, why did you ask, did you know about what's yeah. happened to me? And, um, and it, you know, immediately forged this incredible bond between the three of us. And uh, there was a danger when I was doing Ernest, uh, they were doing it up in Boston and I couldn't do it because Ernest extended and uh, Todd Haynes asked that I stay and they were also going to be producing it. So he said, please, please stay. And uh, so I stayed, uh, did Ernest and then lucked out and was able to do it. And it, no, it was a huge... I think Stephen's play speaks for itself, but it was, uh, no, very special. I want to start traveling oh, once Do I'm... it. Get out and see the world. Yeah, I don't even have a passport. Get Wait. one! No, I know. Well, I'm you gonna, you I'm have gonna, to. Gonna... I mean, until I went abroad and camped out on a Somalian rooftop, you know? Like, walked along Trajan's Wall. Have you ever been to Moldova? No. It's fucking amazing. It's this tiny country next it's to It's in Bulgaria. Eastern Europe. I know where it is. It's shaped like a foot. It's... <laughs> I guess, yeah. Finances are a little tight now. Oh, man, so. I don't come for money. I stayed in hostels starting out. Your dad owns a casino resort. No, Liar. I mean, I, okay, Liar. okay. No, no, I never relied on that, though. And I, I don't travel for me. I... There are so many compelling stories out there that aren't being told, and the fact people don't know about them, it, you know, it compounds their suffering. Is that a line from your book? You think I'd quote my no, own book? No, I'm just book? teasing. It is a line from my book. I'm taking it out. Oh, no, you don't have to. <laughs> I'm, I'm only writing it because I, I do think bearing witness, it gives people's pain life. 
validity. Maybe it gives you validity. You got to work with Brian Bedford. Yes, before with, that, yeah. With the importance of being earnest, I mean, yeah. as a performer and a director, what was that like? <laughs> that was great. That was really fun. I learned a lot. I have some, I have like quotes that Brian said in my, uh, in my phone actually, in the notes section, when he would say <laughs> things like, you know, uh, what did he say? He said, um, <laughs> in, uh, in modern plays, things need to be underplayed or they're not real. But in classic plays, if you don't play them, if you don't play them right, it's like music that's not turned up enough. You know, it's, wow. so say, like to in, you know get us to go for it. And he also was you know he's one of the leading interpreters of that form of theater. So, you know, I learned a lot from him. And you made your nightclub debut at the Cafe Carlisle. I did last summer. Superb. And you have a CD. From, tell me about the CD. Oh gosh. Well, it, yes. I mean, I I was invited to play at the Carlisle, which was also intimidating, and it was my very first concert experience. So, it's it's a little scary to be yourself and trust that you as yourself is enough. Because I'm so used to being a character and having a costume and castmates and a story to tell, and um, it was a um, it was an amazing challenge. And I wasn't doing anything else at the time, so it was kind of the perfect thing to kind of fit between other jobs. And um, it was very fun, and we thought may as well commemorate it yeah. and make an album. And uh, so we did. Did you love the intimacy of playing there? Absolutely. I mean, and it's such a legendary space, and so many famous people have played there. And uh, the Carlisle is such a beautiful hotel. You get to stay there when you sing there. So what? They put you up there, so it's a fantasy world. It was world. lovely. How long did you stay there? Two weeks. Stop. <laughs> I had a two-week run. What? <laughs> so, my agent. Call my yeah, agent right now. And uh, they let my dog. You need to go there now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. play there too. Exactly. You Lila stayed there while you were performing? There? Yes, sir. What is that? I know. So I was living the high life for two weeks while I was there. It was absolutely lovely. And it's a throwback to a whole other time. Oh, ab totally. Yes. My final question, he's saying, I'm going to get booked into the Cafe Carlisle. I know, Carlisle. I, see, I, so, I, I see the I'm just confused by the, yeah. like, that making it, whatever. I invited him to come sing with me when I, I we were busy do doing reading. If I knew that they were going to put me up, I wouldn't come. So, <laughs> Jeez. Please. Okay, so my final question is, I think you sort of answered it here. How much fun are the two of you having? From an audience member sitting in the house, you two look like you're having the best time up there at Cinderella. I wouldn't say Laura's difficult. <laughs> but I would say it's kind of No, we have a great time. It, yes, yeah. it's, so, it's nice because we can kind of be goofy. Kinda. <laughs> so we are goofy. Yeah, no, we're, we're pretty goofy. goofy. You're a little more goofy than I am, but that's he... not true. She just hides it. <laughs> but backstage, the goofy comes out. Let me tell you, and I'm gonna record those moments. Great. And then I'm gonna out you to the world. Great. As a goofy side. Yeah. No, Who, it's really yeah. fun. Who's the biggest prankster on the show? No, you, I'm not. You're the no, only I'm one. Not. Who pranked anyone in the show? You pranked me. I did. No one. I am a professional. I, I studied classical I think, theater. I did. She, however, <laughs> tell them. Oh, tell us the prank. Tell them. I, pulled, I did pull a prank. I'm not. She a put a spider. You see, he brings a it fake out of me though. Spider. He brings it out. In a prop that I have. I'm so. I go to the well. It's like I'm little Laura Osses. Full of water. Small town Sandy. <laughs> What's going on? And I go here. You, here you are, sire, and I give you the water on the horse and the gourd. <laughs> and let's act it out. Go. Okay. So. He's, what, give, him, horse. give me some water. Oh, so that's I, very kind of you, oh, no, wait. Oh, yeah. So I said, okay. so, so, yeah, so give me some water. I go, okay. And I had put a little plastic <laughs> fake big cockroach in the gourd. So I said, here you are, sire. I'm looking down because I can't obviously look at his face. And I said, thank you, young lady. That's very kind of you. Not breaking at all. <laughs> he was so professional. Pro. Pro. And then what I did, I talked to God, and she screwed up a line right after I did. That. I did. I messed up a line. She screwed up a line, went sky high. And I was like. So he said karma. It goes around, comes around. It goes around, comes around. But I'm not really a prankster. <laughs> you. Except for when she is a prankster yeah. and the only one in the set. On the set. On the, the gotcha on moment. the stage. Well, I want to thank the two of you for doing this as you go into your, what, Friday, Saturday, Saturday, Sunday? Friday, no, uh, yes, Saturday, yes, Saturday, yes, for sure, for, for sure. sure weekend. Thank no. you so much. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks.